Welcome to the Artistic Finance Podcast, where we break down the wall between art and money. If you're here looking for how to be an artist and financially sustain a career, you're in the right place. Keep listening and join us as we learn about artists and how they make money work for them. Hello, everyone. This is your host, Ethan Steimel, here for episode 42. Thank you for listening, and a special thank you for listeners who are Patreon patrons. Patrons get the shows early, along with access to the outtakes. If you want to support me and the show, do so at patreon.com slash artistic finance. Real estate has come up on the show many times. Some guests have purchased property and seen it appreciate, some live in rent-stabilized apartments, and some have invested in rental properties. So today, we're going to focus on it. Our guest has an amazing story, and he's connected to artistic finance in three ways. He was a musical theater actor, he actively invests in real estate, and he invests in Broadway shows. Our guest is Matt Piceni, the managing partner at MJP Property Group, a real estate investment company. Matt has invested in over 6,000 apartment units with a focus on acquiring and repositioning multifamily communities. He is a real estate agent, a Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac approved buyer, and has spent over a decade in the marketing departments of Fortune 500 clients. Matt and his wife are Tony-nominated producers, having produced David Byrne's American Utopia and Moulin Rouge. They have also invested in an international tour of Wicked and in Hamilton. Today's episode focuses on real estate, so we only touch briefly on the producing. We still talked about so much we couldn't fit it all into the episode, so you can find the rest over on Patreon. As always, there are links to everything we talk about in the show notes and on our website, artisticfinance.com. Without further ado, let's get to our interview. Welcome, Matt Piceni, to the podcast. Hey, thanks, Ethan. Pleasure to be here. And just before we start, i like to place us in time. For people listening in the future, this is February 3rd, 2021. So we're amidst a COVID-19 pandemic. We're amidst a Black Lives Matter sort of slow burn across the world. And then yesterday, Jeff Bezos stepped down as the CEO of Amazon for whatever that's worth. He did. He did. And there's another thing that just happened that I think I'm, I might touch on, not in depth at all, really, but there's that whole GameStop thing that just happened, right? Yes. People through Reddit, they did a whole thing with GameStop and a couple other companies. And I think they just did a whole thing with Silver where they're actually going and they're buying uh, large amounts of stock to sort of combat hedge funds that are shorting those stocks and those markets because I guess silver is really a commodity, right? So it's interesting. Yeah. And I, that whole situation, so I did an hour long Instagram live about that. Oh, wow. Because I'm not invested in any of that and I am not invested in a hedge fund and I'm not worried about the overall stock market. I absolutely just love watching this all unfold. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) But I know a lot of other people are worried and I... I'm not worried at all. <laughs> Are you? First off, I don't have a hedge fund. I'm not invested <laughs> in any hedge funds or anything like that. And I don't own any individual stocks. Definitely not like GameStop or anything like that. You like own a GameStop? <laughs> <laughs> no, I know you're going to ask some questions about investments and stock markets and mutual funds and things of that nature. And I was just going to say, you know, look, uh, I have a big distrust, if you will, of Wall Street. And that's not to say that I don't have any money in mutual funds or stocks and bonds because I do. Do, but I have over time shifted my portfolio more away from that. The GameStop just points out what my whole hypothesis was, which is like these markets can be manipulated pretty easily. I mean, this was just like a thread on Reddit. There's an inherent amount of volatility in what I consider like vaporware. Okay. So these stocks, it's all just zeros and ones on screens, right? And it's not really like a tangible asset, like a real thing that you can like touch and feel. There's people who say the dollar is going to collapse. It's a fiat currency. It's not really based on anything. It used to be that the dollar was based on gold. We had the gold standard and Nixon got rid of that. Okay. And and by the way, it's not only the dollar, it's like every other uh, currency in the world is also, they're all fiat. But because of that, there are people who think that the dollar is going to go kaput at some point in time. Right. And my theory in investing in things like real estate or like physical gold and silver, things that are tangible, 
they're always going to have some sort of value. So if I own a house, the house still exists and I can still live in it, whether, you know, we're on a dollar as our currency or the yen or we're back to some barter system where we're trading chickens or whatever it ends up being, right? I'll still own that house. And likewise, if I own a house or an apartment building that I rent to people, people will still need a place to live and they will still somehow there will be some exchange of value there. Where if it's just zeros and ones, that stuff can go up and down and disappear. And there's just a such a volatility to it that I have concerns around it. Again, that doesn't mean I don't have any of my portfolio in that, but it's a pretty small portion compared to my the things that I like to invest in actual like tangible, like real assets. Okay, Matt, so you're going to be perfect for this podcast because of this <laughs> distrust of Wall Street, because that's a recurring theme is that a lot of the artists say, oh, well, I don't know what I'm doing with the stock market. Like, I just don't know. I don't figure it out. But at the root of it is this whole like, you know, I'm over here performing or painting or whatever. Right. This Wall Street stuff is just ridiculous. Well, you know, and even <laughs> if you're not an artist, right? And so I do have like an artistic background, but then I, I have been also in the business world. For me, I, you know, I was working in corporate America, you know, in New York City. I, I don't know how corporate it was. I mean, I worked in advertising agencies, which is really fun with lots of creative, interesting people. What was happening is I was putting money in a 401k. And uh, if I would leave one job and go to another, I kept rolling it over into this IRA. And I had this guy, I think it was Morgan Stanley or something like that. And it was a financial advisor that I had. And for years, I would go to him every year. They would take 1% off the top of whatever I had invested. It's fine. Like over time, it kind of chips away at it. But then there was all these other hidden fees throughout the whole thing. But the bottom line was my portfolio really wasn't growing. Like there really wasn't that much value. I could have taken my money, I think, and put it into just ETFs and done better and had less fees. So I would have, I would have ended up better, but I just didn't understand it. And when I said, I said, I almost don't own individual stocks. I own about 15 different stocks, okay? These stocks I own about between one to 10 shares of each of these stocks because I had bought individual stocks and then eventually sold them off. But I was like, oh, I want to keep one share of each thing to see like how well it does over time. And some of them kind of like reinvest, uh, but it's a few thousand dollars. It's not a large amount of money uh, by any stretch of the imagination. What's in there is very small. But when I was doing all of that, I would buy a stock based on, you know, whatever certain thing that I would know that the company is doing this thing or that thing, whatever, you know, all publicly available information. But I'm like, oh, that's a great thing that they're doing this. or that's a great thing that they're doing that. And I buy in on it. Their earnings would be great, but the stock would go down or their earnings would be down and the stock would go down or like whatever. It just it didn't seem to make sense. I couldn't seem to make any rhyme or reason to it. And I think that there are different forces pulling on it that are able to manipulate it. Hedge funds, large traders can come in and buy large amounts and, and actually manipulate that stock value. And they're playing around, you know, these guys doing the stuff on GameStop, you know, they're having a fun time. They're playing a game, right? But like for me, I'm like, this is my retirement. This is my livelihood. This is money I need. I've been to Vegas a couple of times and I had fun putting money down on a roulette wheel, but it wasn't like tens of thousands of dollars when you're talking about retirement funds and you're putting it on a roulette wheel. Like that's scary to me. I have over time pulled a lot of my money out of those types of mutual funds and things like that because I don't understand it. And it's not that I don't understand it. It's that I just don't, I don't get it. Like I understand how it works. I don't understand the rhyme and reason behind some of the movements that happen. Yep. Yep. I love all that. Oh, so also, Matt, I do have a strict artist only policy for oh, really? guests on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> though, though I will say we did actually have one lawyer on who happened to be a real estate lawyer, but he's a he was a theater investor, a Broadway investor. Okay. And he also knows a lot about theater. But I, I would say you're like my first non artist. Let me lead that into this question, how you got into your profession and where you are now just sort of give us a quick overview of yeah. And before all of your listeners sort of dismiss me as not being part of the, the club, part of the tribe. <laughs> you know, I was a professional actor for five years in New York City. You know, I grew up in Orlando, Florida. I moved to New York. I went to AMDA, the American Musical Dramatic Academy, uh, where I was a musical theater student. And I graduated from there. Three days after graduation, I was off on my first bus and truck tour. 
theater for young audiences production of Aladdin performed all over the U.S. Uh, to to raving six and seven year olds who just loved <laughs> us. Uh, you know, it was fun, uh, good times. And then I, you know, I continued in theater and had a professional career for five years. Uh, I produced. I was in fifteen different productions across the United States. I worked at places like Goodspeed and Paper Mill and Kansas City Starlight. I mean, I could go on and on name, naming all 15 places, but like, it was a lot of fun. I had a great time. I made some amazing friends and it was fantastic. And I really loved it and really enjoyed what I was doing. After about five years doing regional theater and bus and truck tours, you know, I felt like I wanted to settle down a little bit. The earlier part of my career, I was, I didn't have a place to stay. I was kind of homeless, you know, like I would just couch surf when I was back in town. And then as I got a little bit older, I ended up getting a, a place and, you know, trying to deal with sublets and, you know, all kinds of stuff. And it just, it was difficult. And I was like, listen, I'm paying a lot of money for rent in New York and I want to enjoy New York. Like I like that. I, I like I'm in New York, but I'm never in New York. And I want to be in New York a little bit more. I feel like I've sort of paid my dues five years out on the road. I was getting callbacks for Broadway shows. You know, I had a, several callbacks for rent, which was a big deal at that time, right? And uh, I, I just felt like, listen, I'm going to just kind of stick around here and, and wait for the right thing to open up and, the, you know, the timing to be right. And I'll get cast in a Broadway show. While I was doing that, I started tinkering around with computers. Ended up getting a lot of opportunities to um, freelance coding, doing like HTML. I taught myself HTML coding, which isn't really coding, but kind of coding, uh, where I would work at these cool new media agencies in New York, as they were called at the time, new media. Well, first off, I liked the idea of doing that because I was before that I was waiting tables at the Hard Rock Cafe, and I was kind of sick of doing that, working really late nights. This was back when you could smoke in the restaurants. And so I would be in the smoky restaurant all night. And it was, it was a lot of work. These I would work like actually during daylight hours. And the thing that was really eye opening to me was like all the people I was working with were all actors and musicians and other kinds of artists. Like that's who was attracted to these new media gigs, you know, a lot of creative people. There's a lot of uh, creative work that gets done in these agencies. And so that was really appealing to me from a cultural perspective, because the same kind of people that I tend to hang out with, you know, it sort of kind of grew from there. I was getting so much work that I started doing work at night from my home. And then I got to a point where I was like, hey, I'm just going to work from home and just do everything remotely. And then there was still so much work coming in that I put another desk in my apartment and I would hire people to come in and work with me. You know, I'd charge like an extra couple bucks an hour, you know, to the client. So I'd make a slight markup. Well, it got to the point where I needed a third desk and my little apartment in New York City wouldn't hold it anymore. So I ended up getting an office space and I created my own boutique agency. And so I ran that boutique agency for almost five years. The dot-com bubble burst and then 9-11 came along. Showtime was a client of mine, the cable television channel. And they were looking for someone in-house and things were just a mess. And so I said, hey, what about me? And they one of their key roles was going to be to maintain a website that I had actually built. And they're like, well, you built it, of course, we'll hire, you know. So I went in there and uh, worked at Showtime for about five years. It was a lot of fun, but I got a couple of promotions, but it was like, I, I was going to have to wait for someone to die to get the next promotion. It was just like, I kind of went as far as I could without the head of our department leaving or something like that. And he was awesome. He wasn't going anywhere. A lot of the robust site development that was being done at the time was being done by the advertising agencies. So I went over to Ogilvy, and that was the first advertising agency that I worked at. You know, I think it was 18 years total, including my time at Showtime. So it would have been about 13 years working at different ad agencies in New York City, climbing the corporate ladder, if you will, doing that. And I was a project manager. So my job was to make sure things were getting done on budget on time at the highest quality possible. It's very similar to like a stage manager or stage managers, hybrid company manager type role if you're equating it to theater. And so I did that for many years. While I was doing that, I started doing some real estate stuff on the side. And I met my wife who works uh, in Broadway on the producing side of things or the business side of things, right? She's had a number of different roles sort of behind the scenes. She got approached with a really cool job opportunity, which had us moving down to Miami. My wife, Erica, was hired to be the uh, director of programming for the Arsht Center 
in Miami. So people who don't know it, it's Miami's version of Lincoln Center, if you will, where they have lots of different things. You know, they have ballet and they'll have an orchestra and they'll have a Broadway series and they'll have comedians and rock music and all kinds of different stuff. That was awesome. She really enjoyed that. It was completely out of the blue. We weren't looking to move. She got a, she got a phone call and got recruited. Fantastic opportunity. You know, as many of the people probably on the show know, uh, you know, a lot of Broadway stuff is, is not large corporations, it's much smaller corporations. So for her to have this opportunity, it was it was working, you know, she'd have a staff of like 11 people. It was, it was a, a nice step up for her. So we were down there for a couple of years and then she got recruited out of the blue for another gig. Uh, and so we live in Boston now. She was hired by ATG to come up here and reopen the, uh, the Colonial Theater, which is a theater in Boston where a lot of Broadway shows, I, I couldn't name them all, but Porgy and Bess was one of the first ones that was done Oklahoma, which was, I believe, called Away We Go when it was here in Boston, and then and then moved to Broadway. So that's what happened. We moved up here. She reopened and runs as the general manager of the Colonial Theater. And, uh, you know, we live here. We have two children. Yeah, that's our, that's our thing. So w- when we moved to Miami, I moved from the corporate world doing advertising to doing real estate full-time. And so I've been a full-time real estate investor for about five and a half years at this point. Okay. Could you describe your demographics for us? So in March, I'll be turning 48 years old. Wow. You're still very young. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, just with everything you described, because rent was like 96, right? Yeah, that, yeah. Right? Or I, It was before 96. I think it was probably like 94, 95. Okay. I think. I can Google it while we're talking. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> you're right. It's all right. You're right. It was April 29th, 1996 that it opened at the Nederlander Theater. Okay. Yeah. I think the last professional show that I did was in 97. Um, okay. So you're 48. Race and gender? I am a male and I am white. Education, I don't know if you said or if it matters. It doesn't really, but. I think education is pointless. I graduated from high school, barely. Uh <laughs> Seriously, I graduated from the American Musical and Dramatic Academy. On to your creative personality. What is a live event that you like to experience as an audience member? It's all about music for me, right? I'm a huge fan of music. So one of the perks about having a, a wife who is in the entertainment industry is once in a while, she can actually get us decent tickets to go see shows. So like, I'll go, I like, I love rock and alternative and stuff like that. So I like, I showed up at AMDA, everyone would pull out their CD collections and people would have Andrew Lloyd Webber and Steven Sondheim. I didn't even know who Sondheim was when I moved to New York, right? <laughs> My yeah. CD collection was like, Nirvana and you know I had the Beatles but I'd have like Alice in Chains like I had like this kind of like alternative rock music I I really wanted to be like a rock musician but I just didn't have that really cool vibe (laughs) so I ended up in musical theater which was another way to be a musician you know I play lots of different instruments so some of the shows I was in I actually played you know guitar in the show or When I was in Tommy, I did the harmonica part. Like I did a whole bunch of things with music. I'm just a big fan of music. So I love going to see live events that have music involved, whether it's like a like a rock concert or musical theater or whatever. If there's music in, I'm in. That's awesome. So you're the kind of person that they were targeting for like Springsteen on Broadway. Yeah, maybe. I never saw it. The tickets were insane, but I think it's on Netflix. I gotta check it out. I never got into the boss. I don't know why. I you know, (laughs) nothing against him. It just wasn't really my thing. But Bruce is awesome. Now, David Byrne with American Utopia on Broadway, that was really my speed. And it was also my great honor, along with my wife, to be co-producers on that show. And that was an awesome show. Nice. What is a piece of art that you like? I'm a huge fan of Salvador Dali. I know your listeners are listening, but you're seeing me on video right now. And there's a Dali painting right behind me. I like the photographer Peter Lick. I have one of his. He has a gallery downtown. So when COVID's over, go check it out. Or you can view him online. It's L-I-K. He takes these beautiful photographs. They're gorgeous. And supposedly he doesn't Photoshop them at all. I don't know if that's true or not. Like they're, they're fantastic. Breathtaking. I'm not disparaging Peter Lick. I'm sure he doesn't. But it, they're just, they're gorgeous photos that he takes of different sort of nature scenes. So, th- you know, those are people, and you know, besides all the, you know, I mean, I could just sit around and name musicians for the next 20 minutes. But yeah, those are, those are some, uh, I think, visual artists that I really appreciate. Are you bad or good with money? Uh, I'm 
pretty good with money. Yeah, seems like it. I feel like we've already picked that up. <laughs> well, you know, I think it's just a project manager in me, right? I'm just very, you know, you know, when, when you're younger and you take these like aptitude tests and stuff when you're a kid, right? They were all always said I was kind of like really analytical. They're like, you'd be a great lawyer. I'm like, I am not interested in that. And I'm not interested in going to school for that long. And I do, I'm just very good at sort of like compartmentalizing and putting things together. Like, you know, maybe I have like an engineer's brain or something like that. I don't know. And that's why I think I was able to pick up programming really quickly and easily for me. It just made sense putting puzzles together, right? That's really what it is. I love puzzles. For me, the finance stuff is like that. It's like, it's very kind of like cut and dry, black and white, like, uh, and, and, and I could just kind of put the pieces together. So it's, I, I don't know, I just have an aptitude for it. Growing up, did you have good financial examples to learn from? I had a good financial example and a bad financial example. The bad financial example was really good from a business perspective. So my mother, that's where I get that sort of, I don't know if it's type A, but like whatever the compartmentalizing project manager stuff. My mom is that person, right? She would always clean the house. Like everything was always clean. Back in the, back in the day when I was born, she didn't work. Um, she, she stayed at home and then had my sister. And then after my sister was, I think in kindergarten or something, my mom started working again. And she worked as like a bookkeeper. Just it was randomly happened to be architectural firms in Florida. She ended up starting a business with one of the architects. He asked her if he would she would leave and be his office manager, and she said, "No, I won't, but I'll, I'll I will leave and be your business partner." And he took her up on it. But the thing I was always impressed with my mother, like if I would go to the office for something or whatever. She had everything, all the folders and everything and canceled checks and like the whole night, like she really knew how to run the office. And I mean, this is back before there was even QuickBooks. I think she had like one of those like ledger binder things, like where you write all the accounting stuff. Like, I don't know. I was younger at the time, but I mean, she just was so organized with everything. And I think she was really good from that perspective. My father was more of an entrepreneur type person. When I was very young, he actually was in real estate as a real, like a residential real estate broker type person. When I was first born, he actually, he worked in the entertainment, like um, had a place called the Mystery Fun House, which I think is still there. It's right across the street from what is now and what didn't even exist at the time, Universal Studios. It's this little, fun, it's like a fun house and they have like mini golf and stuff like that. And there's a picture of me as a little kid in front of the gift shop. It was called Matt's Gift Shop. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he did that for like a few years. I don't know how long. I think he was first selling insurance when he moved down to Florida. There, he's from New York. And my mom and dad had both met in New York. So then he did real estate. And then he went back to school. He decided he wanted to get into film. And the film industry was supposedly coming to Orlando because Universal. But it didn't really happen the way that it was being told. But my dad had not finished college and he went back to school and finished college in Florida during that time. He still had his real estate license and was driving and he was taking a shortcut to the airport that we used to take. And he drove by this place and they had a big for sale for by owner sign. And I remember that as a kid, my dad, anytime we went by a place that was for sale by owner, he would stop the car and write down the phone number. And I'm like, oh, here we go again. Well, it turns out my dad calls finds out what's going on with this guy. This property that was being sold was actually a commissary. So what it was, was it was a place where people specifically like hot dog vendors, but anyone at like a lunch, like any kind of like mobile food type thing. I think it depends on the municipality, but in Florida, you had to belong to a commissary. And the commissary, that's where you would buy your product from. They had ice and things like that. Also big ice machines, but they would also have like certain health regulations. Like they would have a sink, there's like a cold water and a hot water and a sanitizer. There was like certain regulations that they had to meet. So everyone had to like go there, use it or whatever. So my father finds out that that's what this guy has that he's selling. And then my dad starts finding out a little bit about the business. And my dad's like, this is a fantastic business. And so my dad bought the property and the business from the guy. I mean, the guy's business, the guy had just started his own commissary because he was like a, a, actually like a hot dog vendor. The other commissary in town, people didn't like him. So this guy like started it and some of his buddies were all using it. But my dad was like, I can make this like a real business. And he did. Like by the time this was happening, I was at least 10 years old when all this was happening, probably older. I actually saw my dad grow the business and my dad explained the business for me. I actually worked for my dad a little bit in the business when I wasn't working at Disney because remember I was a performer. I used to work at Disney, but I learned from him, I think sort of just like 
kind of the basics of business. And his business, I don't think did like incredibly well, like my mother's business did. And I don't think my dad was great with like finances and like savings and like things like that. But he had a business sense to him. He knew how to kind of put things together. So I think I learned that from him, but I learned how to sort of like manage the money from my mom, right? Like right brain, left brain kind of sort of yin and yang there. Yeah. Okay. I love that. I love that explanation. And also I love that you learned all that not from school, which is sort of cool about you. 100%. All the real estate stuff I did not learn from school. I did have a mentor and I joined a program. Um, but I didn't go to school for it. I ended up going to Boston University when we moved to Boston to get like a formal education in real estate and to see if I missed anything. And I didn't, I hadn't missed anything, but it was great networking. I'm glad I did it, you know, but I didn't really learn like new things. Okay, so these next questions sort of lead and tie into real estate and you already sort of touched on them. So do you have any debts right now? Yes. <laughs> and what are they, may, may I ask? <laughs> R- roughly, you don't have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I'm, I'm fine with that. You know, what, what I'll tell you is that actually, personally, I don't have a lot of debt, but I um, am an owner of a com- lot of companies that have debt. I, I invest passively in a lot of real estate. I have 6,000 units, apartment units that I'm invested in. Some of those are deals that I own and run, you know, and then some of them are other people's deals. You know, the ones that are other people's deals, there's debt on that. Um, but it's not, I didn't like sign on the debt on the deals that I run. I sign on the debt, but all that debt is non-recourse, which means they can't come after me personally. If the business fails. Now, if I do something like embezzle the money or cook the books or whatever, then they can, then it becomes recourse debt and they can come after me personally. And then there's a couple properties that I own on my own that are recourse debt but they're actually, it's not me. I have a company and the companies own the property. Me, myself, I'm a guarantor on some non-recourse debt. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a guarantor on the recourse debt for those other properties too. Yeah, I am. I, now that I'm thinking about it, I am on those, but it's not insignificant, but it's not, it's not like billions of dollars or something like that. Yeah. Is most of your income W-2 income or 1099 income? It's it's neither. Most of the income that I get um, from my passive investments comes through as a K-1. So if anyone who's listening to this may have invested in a thing such as a Broadway show, they'll also receive a K-1. So it's not a 1099, it's a K-1. I do now also get a W-2 salary. I do have a company and I pay myself. I just started paying myself last year. <laughs> so it's nice because before it was just kind of, it would be like, oh, a deal closed or whatever. I'd get a little influx of cash, but it wasn't steady. And at this point now I've been able to sort of just give myself like a decent salary. Nothing crazy. Um, the K-1. So I consider K-1 1099 income, but I guess it's not. Well, I think technically a 1099 income would be like an actual t- wouldn't you get a 1099 in the, or, or W? Yeah, yeah, you would get a 1099 saying you did this. So K-1 is different because it's like a passive thing. It's a K-1. Yeah, it's a K-1. So I guess I have to add that to my question. Do you get K-1? <laughs> yeah, I think, right? I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a CPA or accountant. I know this goes into your next question, which is like, do I do my own taxes? And the answer is no. Like, I have a CPA who handles all that for me. I used to do my own. I, I ended up buying a piece of land. The first, like, real, I got interested in real estate because of, a primary residence. When I was an actor, I have a relative in New York, okay, who let me basically stay in his co-op and pay the maintenance fee. It was super generous of him. Like, it was awesome. Otherwise, I never could have afforded to live in Manhattan um, and, and live in Chelsea, no less. It was great. But then he was like, look, I got to sell. You got to move out. When that happened, I needed to find a place to live. And I moved into Was- a place in Washington Heights, and I bought something. It was the first time I bought something. It was cheaper than renting in Manhattan and probably about the same as, as renting something in Queens, but I bought, I ended up selling the property a little over two years later and like quadrupled my initial investment. And I was like, Ooh, light bulb. Like what, what's the, what just happened? Like, what's this real estate thing I've always heard about? And wow, that's incredible. 
that's when I started doing it as a hobby. I, I then bought something on 70 in, on the Upper West Side and I lived there. And then I bought my first investment thing, which was a property in Connecticut. And what I bought was a piece of land. And TurboTax didn't know how to handle that. And the software just wasn't sophisticated enough. And I was like, I don't know how to do my taxes. That's when I went to somebody. And my sister was in a networking group and she knew like a CPA and they cut me a break because I was like a little guy. I was like the smallest account in their whole firm or whatever. But they they helped me out. From then on, I've always used the CPA because my taxes have just over time gotten more complex. It really comes down to the rental properties and depreciation. And those are things that I've learned about. I could probably do my taxes now, maybe, but now I have like corporate taxes, which I don't even know how to file. Those are different forms. And it's just, yeah, so I have a CPA who does all that. Do, and does the CPA handle like all of those other in- companies? Like, do they do everything for you? Yes. So it's a one-stop shop for you? That's great. Yes. What is your retirement plan, account, savings, all that look like? So a lot of my retirement has been put into my company, um, but my other retirement accounts are not in an IRA and they're not in a 401k. I have moved all of my retirement into something called an EQRP, Enhanced Qualified Retirement Program. What that allows me to do, and the reason why I did that, some of your listeners may have heard and you may have talked about self-directed IRAs, in which case you can go ahead and invest in other things besides just the few options that are available through your 401k or IRA custodian. With the self-directed, you can invest in almost anything you want. You can't invest in collectibles like baseball cards or whatever, but you could invest in, let's say, a Broadway show or individual stocks, or you can still invest in those mutual funds and ETFs. That's fine too. So it just gives you flexibility. The thing is, if you buy property in a SDIRA, self-directed IRA or self-directed 401k or solo 401k, in any of those, you're actually subject to a thing called UBIT tax. Basically, if you buy a, a property, okay, so let's say you buy something and you make just for round numbers, $100,000. If it's in an IRA or 401k, you would think, oh, there's no taxes. Well, that's not so because what happened was the property that was bought is usually bought with leverage. So let's say they bought it with 75% mortgage, which is like a standard amount usually. That would mean 75% of your profits is taxed. So out of the $100,000 that you made off of that deal, $25,000 is not taxed, but the other $75,000 is taxed inside the an IRA or 401k, which is supposed to be a tax shelter, it's supposed to grow tax-free. You know, if it's a Roth, you take that money out later, it doesn't matter because you pay taxes at the beginning, but even on a regular one, the whole point is you didn't pay taxes, it grows tax-free and you only take the taxes when you take the money out, you pay the taxes. So um, it kind of defeats the purpose. Uh, a, a QRP allows you to not have to pay that UBIT tax. So that's why I do it. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a phenomenal thing. But I will say, you know, I, I've converted all my stuff kind of over to that. Looking at that portfolio, about half of it is in stocks and bonds, and the other half of it is in sort of the non-traditional investment. <laughs> okay. All right. So that's a QRB? QRP. QRP, Qualified Retirement Plan. Okay. This is the first time consciously that I've ever heard of this. Cool. All right, man. So glad I'm talking to you. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. Okay. So now to get into real estate, which is why you're here, really. (laughs) Yeah. Real estate, like you said, you had a light bulb moment when you bought something and it quadrupled in a couple of years. We have had other people, artists on this podcast where they have had, oh, I bought it. Man, when I sold it, I realized if I went back in time, I would say, get into real estate or buy something or do whatever I could to sort of get some sort of property. And the other thing is I read like financial blogs, like how do you get rich? How do you build wealth? How do you get wealthy? And eventually real estate always comes into the picture. So my question to you, Matt, is should everyone invest in real estate? No. Okay. Uh, (laughs) Who should, who shouldn't? I do think everybody should ultimately invest in real estate. I do think that you need to make sure your financial house is in order prior to doing that. You know, just jumping in, if you have like high credit card debt or something like that, doesn't make sense. You know, interest rate on your credit card is, I don't know, 19%, 18%, maybe something like that, where your return on real estate is going to be 5%, 10%, you know, maybe 20% in the long run. But you know, that compounding on that credit card, like, so if you're in a decent financial state, yes, you definitely should invest in real estate. If all of your money is only in stocks and bonds, I think you're cruising for a bruising. Any financial planner will tell you, you know, diversity is really important in the portfolio. Now they may not recommend, 
investing in real estate. And unfortunately, some financial advisors, or I might even venture to say most financial advisors, are only getting compensated based on the money that they have under their management. So if you were to have, I don't know, let's say you had a million dollars saved up in your retirement account, you took like half of $500,000 out to do some stuff with the real estate. I mean, I know I'm talking big numbers here, but I'm just trying to just coming up with round, big round numbers. You know, half of their money is gone. Like they were making what, like $10,000 a year off of you. And now it just went down to 5,000, right? So it's like, they're not going to necessarily recommend here, take half of my salary. You know, there are financial advisors who aren't like that, who aren't compensated solely based on the percentage that they have under management. And those are the type that I would talk to if you were going to use a financial advisor. Yeah, like investing in real estate, which again, also we talked about at the beginning, it's not zeros and ones, it's an actual tangible thing too. I think it's just important to diversify your portfolio. I'm not saying don't do stocks and bonds, but I'm saying, okay, but you know, maybe you should have equal amount in tangible assets, maybe more than equal. I don't know. I mean, you have to figure out kind of like what your risk tolerance is, how, what you feel comfortable with as an investor. What do you care about? I invest in Broadway shows. My wife and I are producers on Broadway shows. So we'll have people who come in with us and invest in deals, right? Invest in, in Broadway shows, just like I do on the real estate stuff. And you know, the real estate stuff is risky. And I tell people that, but it's not nearly as risky as, as the theatrical stuff, right? Musicals, like that's again a musical. I, we've done very well. We've hit some good ones. We've also lost money, you know, and you have to be okay with losing money. You could even lose all of your money. So, you know, I always caution people like any sort of investment that you're doing. One of the things that I've heard bandied around, which I think is probably a good thing, is that you shouldn't put more than 5% of your net worth in any particular investment. That way, you know, if you have $100 in net worth and you lose five bucks, is it going to hurt? Yeah, but you still have $95. If you have all your money in the stock market and something does happen in the stock market, the stock market goes down 50%. It has to go up 100% for you to get back to even, just to get back to where you were. And that's rough. Um, okay, so I want to get into accredited investing and ask you this, because from my understanding, if you want to invest in a Broadway show, or if you want to invest in a real estate deal, that you have to be an accredited investor. Is that true for real estate? That is not true. I don't think it would even be true for Broadway shows, depending on how they're structured. I believe all the Broadway shows I've been involved in are structured in a way where you do need to be accredited. I kind of don't want to just give you like a quick answer on this. I'm going to do it kind of quickly, but I want people to understand what it is and how it works. So anything that you sell in the United States, right? That That is uh, like an investment. If you're selling an investment, you're actually, it's a, it's a security by definition. Securities in the United States are managed by an organization. If there's a federal organization you've probably heard of called the SEC, it's the Sur Securities and Exchange Commission. Like if you hear about people doing bad stuff on Wall Street, the SEC gets involved and all that kind of thing. Any security that you're selling in the United States needs to be registered with the SEC. And you, as the person selling it, need to be a broker dealer. You have to have a broker dealer's license, which I don't know what the requirements are. I think you have to have like a series 66 and like whatever. There's there's a number of things that tests that you have to take and classes and registrations of whatever. Okay. So if you're not a registered broker dealer and your thing is not as a security, you're really not allowed to bring investors in on it. Okay. It's just, it's against the law. Now, when we're doing real estate specifically, we have usually like 60 to 90 days from the time, like we see something that we like and we put in an offer and it's accepted until the time you have to close. That's not going to be enough time to register something with the Securities and Exchange Commission. And also the legal fees to register something with the Securities and Exchange Commission are exorbitant, right? I mean, look, if you're opening up a company and you're doing like an IPO or something, yeah, you do that. You're supposed to do that and it makes sense. But for a real estate investment, it doesn't. Plus, I'm not a registered broker dealer. So the question is, how do we do something legally when we, it's not registered with the SEC and it's not registered broker. Well, what we do is we work with an SEC attorney and we use an exemption that the SEC has. The SEC says, hey, look, if you follow these certain rules, then this thing is exempt. It's not a security. We don't consider it a security if, you, if it follows these things. So in the securities and exchange laws, there is a regulation called Regulation D. Most of your deals are gonna be done under a Regulation D offering. 
Regulation D has two subsections, 506B and 506C. And again, I'm sorry, listeners, I know this is getting a little dense, but I think it's important and it doesn't go any further than this, okay? 506B and 506C. 506C says you have to be an accredited investor to invest in the deal. And the accredited investor is defined by the SEC. You have to have a net worth of a million dollars or more, not including your primary residence. That's one way. Or you've made $200,000 a year or more for the past two years with the reasonable expectation that you will continue making that kind of money. Or you and your spouse or domestic partner make 300k a year for the past two with the except with the expectation that that will continue so what if you follow fall into one of those three categories you're accredited you can do a 506c and if you sign up to do it i mean when i'm doing my real estate deals we we make sure that you uh, actually have an affidavit signed by your cpa or your uh, attorney to like verify that you are indeed because it's the onus is on us to make sure that you actually are accredited. And I don't want to be prying into your tax returns. Like your CPA can can sign an affidavit and verify. Now there's also a 506B with a 506B offering, which is what I do for like 99% of my real estate deals. I do under 506B. I can take in the accredited investors. I can also bring in sophisticated investors. Now there's a real definition for accredited investors. We know what that is. The SEC doesn't have like a clear cut definition for sophisticated investors. And I'll get into that in one second. There's another part of it, which is that whoever it is accredited or not, you have to have a pre-existing substantive relationship with that person. And again, pre-existing and substantive isn't really clearly spelled out. The bottom line is, Ethan, I just met you at a meetup or at a party and we exchanged business cards. We made some pleasantries and that's it. I wouldn't be able to call you up the next day and be, Ethan, I've got this deal under contract that I'm doing and it's awesome and you should invest in it. Because I already had that deal sort of in process and our relationship really isn't substantive. So what I do with anybody that I meet that would be interested in investing in real estate, because I want to have that investors like, you know, I'm all for it. I make sure that I get to know them. So Ethan, if you were to tell me that you were interested in investing in real estate, uh, I have like actual like a little form on my website that takes like five minutes. I'd ask you to fill out, and then I'd set up a conversation for you and I to chat, kind of like we're chatting right now. And I'd ask you some of the questions you've just asked me to understand where you are financially and kind of like what your financial goals are to see if it's like a good fit for the things that I'm doing. All my investors, I'm very picky about the investors that I allow into my deals. It's got to be people that I've met, that I've talked with, that I've. I used to always want to meet them in person. Now that's getting kind of hard, especially with the COVID, but at least get on a Zoom with them, get to know them, they get to know me. And then we feel comfortable about one another. And then I will add them to my, I have like two lists. I have a list that I just sent out a newsletter and updates like every month. But then I have the list for the people that are in my investors club. And that's when I have like a deal. It'll go out only exclusively to those in the investors club. Okay, man, Matt, I am so glad I asked you that question. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because that is amazing. Because I, I was thinking, like, if anybody listening to this wanted to invest with you and your company, yes. I was thinking they had to be accredited. No. And I even get emails from your company, like your weekly or monthly updates. Yeah. I get those. And I remember one, I thought, hey, maybe I'll sign up to, like, not be in the investors club, but, like, I don't know, there's there was some option you gave. And I was like, well, since I'm not accredited, I'm not going to bother filling that out sure but now i'm thinking well maybe i could go sign up to get those emails (laughs) yeah even if you want i mean i think if if, seriously if this is you can cut this from the podcast if you want but if you do want to talk about it we should have set up a a subsequent conversation yeah fill out the form i'll ask you to set up a time on my calendar we could have a conversation about it see if it's a good fit or not yeah but I'm, i'm i'm just so thrilled because i was like because th- to me, this is always one of my problems that I've thought with Broadway shows. It's like, I, you know, I'm a lighting designer. So I, I want the actors and the designers. I want them to be able to put money into a Broadway show. Yes. But I always thought there's this huge hurdle of accredited investing. And I think there is. So for the Broadway shows, 
again, it depends. Most of the time they're set up as a 506C, the one where you need to be accredited. I wouldn't say all the time to, it just sort of kind of depends, but all the ones I've seen, you do have to be accredited. I, you know, the, if you're not accredited to invest in a Broadway show is, it might be kind of risky because yeah, I mean, the risk, they are risky. I'm just saying though, they might like affect your net worth so much. You know what I mean? Like if you don't have more than a million dollars of investable assets, that is not including your house, maybe investing in a Broadway show isn't the best thing for you yet. And maybe you continue to build your portfolio. such that thing you do have enough net worth where losing 25, 50 K on a Broadway show and some shows I've seen the minimums like 100K for a Broadway show. You know, you lose 100K, even if you're worth, your net worth is a million dollars, that's like, that's 10% of your net worth that's like poof, gone. So, you know. Stay away yeah. from, but real estate. <laughs> well, you can lose all your money in real estate too. You can, you can lose all your money in real estate. I think the odds of it happening in real estate are a lot less than the odds in of, of a Broadway show. Yeah. Do you think that renting, so like I'm in Manhattan, I rent an apartment. Do you think that's a, a waste of money or should I try very hard to think about it and try to go buy a place? So I think you need to look at your particular situation, Ethan. Mm -hmm. I wrote about the, I'm, I'm writing a book. It's going to come out this summer. And I talk about this in the book. You know, that first place that I mentioned earlier in Washington Heights that I bought in uh, Manhattan, uh, you know, it made sense because I was paying about $500 per month in mortgage payments less than what my rent would be on the Upper West Side, which is where I, I wanted to live on the Upper West Side. And this was the Upper, 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 Upper West Side because it was in Washington Heights. Upper. <laughs> I was like, hey, I'm saving $500 a month and I have home ownership gaining equity in a property. That was a good thing. Where I live right now, I rent. People look at me like I have three heads when they find out that I rent. You know, you're a real estate investor. You own 6,000 apartment units across the United States and you rent in the town where I live, I live in Brookline, Massachusetts. It's a great town. It's awesome. The schools are amazing. Everything about it's amazing. I love, absolutely love living here. The cost for me to buy a property, pay the mortgage payments, insurance, and taxes are astronomical compared to what I'm paying for rent. I happen to have a really good deal where, where I'm living also. But even if I didn't, it, it wouldn't, it still would never add up to the same. My wife and I have looked at buying things around here. If I could find a real beat up house that needs a lot of work that I can do over time, then it might make sense financially. But right now it just doesn't make sense. And I have to plop down a huge down payment. Like I probably have to put like $300,000 or so down on a house here where I can take that $300,000 and invest it in real estate. And then that gives me cash flow of, if I got 10% return, that'd be like $30,000 a year. That'd be like almost $3,000 a month, which helps defray my rent astronomically. It, it doesn't make sense for the situation I'm in right now. But when in that other situation, it did make sense. So it depends on like, where you're living, would you live in the same neighborhood? How much is properties costing right now? What is rent? What would your mortgage payments look like? You know, if your mortgage payment and your insurance and, and taxes, if they're the same as your rent, then I would say buy. You know, you have to take a chunk of money out for the down payment, which could be costly, but it probably would make sense for you to buy, especially don't buy if you're not planning on living there for at least five years too. You have closing costs at the beginning when you buy and closing costs at the end when you sell and those transaction costs can add up. So it kind of doesn't make sense unless you're going to live there for at least five years, I would say. If it makes sense, you know, if it's a, the same or around the same, it probably makes sense. Or if you're saving money by, by paying that. Yeah, buy. Otherwise, I would say renting might be the more prudent thing. And then you that big down payment, which might have only been, let's say it's only fifty thousand. You know, you can take that fifty thousand and put that into a real estate syndication and hopefully get five thousand dollars a year in cash flow. And then when it sells, you know, you basically the way these real estate deals, at least the ones I do, are, are set, you're supposed to essentially and this is supposed to, right? It depends on how it works. Lately, we've had really good real estate markets. So we're able to exit our deals in like two or three years, but usually they're supposed to be like five or six years and you're supposed to double your money over that time. So if you put 50K into a deal, you're supposed to walk away with a hundred if the deal you know, performs well. You know, you could put that money into something and then five years later, you know, have a lot more and then you were renting. So 
I don't know. I hope that helps, gives you some guidance. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Say there's an actor just moves to New York City. They're listening to this and they say, okay, well, these guys are saying I, I have to get into real estate at some point. What do you think a path forward for them would be? Like if, let's say they don't have a ton of money at the moment. Um, <laughs> You're like, I would not be an uh, actor. Yeah, I would, that's what I was going to say. Should I be honest here? Like, don't, don't be, if you want to buy real estate, don't be an actor. Uh, you know, I, I, and I, and I don't, I say that as, you know, as a joke, but also somewhat serious. Yeah, no, they're serious there. Uh, I was living off of the generosity of a relative who owned a property that he was, he was kind of stuck with the property. Anyhow, I took over the property tax. It was a win-win. I'm all about win-wins. Like that's like, I always try to make in the real estate stuff that I do. Like it's all sort of, I'm not like an evil slumlord kind of guy. I, I got into real estate because I needed a place to live. I was so into rent at the time. And I was like thinking about that character, Benny. Benny is like this guy who like married some rich woman and he becomes a landlord, right? He owns the building, but he also becomes like a real jerk, right? As Roger, you know, he's like, what happened to Benny? What happened to his heart? And the ideals he once pursued, right? So it's like, what happened to this guy? Like he became a total jerk. And I was sitting there back at that time in my life saying, and gee, like, what if I bought something to live in? And like, what if I bought like a building? Like, how do you buy a building? Like, I obviously didn't do that right away, but I was like, oh, could I be a landlord, but be like a landlord who's like nice, <laughs> like a good landlord and not be like this evil landlord that you see in the movies, like, you know, slumlord kind of guy. Like, could I be, and, and that's something I try really hard to do. So all the properties that we buy, we try to make improvements for the residents. And like right now with COVID going on, we're working with people on payment plans and figuring, and even before COVID, there was like a government furlough a little while ago, like a year or two ago, we worked with the tenants that worked for the government at the time. We're like, don't worry about it. We're not going to kick you out of your house. Like we get it. It's beyond your control. We'll work out a payment plan. Like we try to do that. Now, sometimes the inevitable happens and, and it doesn't work out, but we always do our best. I just try to improve lives, right? Improve lives of investors. Look, I'm in there to make a profit. Don't get me wrong. This isn't a charity, right? But I think we can do that in a really humane way. But basically, as a actor, I never made the kind of money that I would need. I started my own business and was doing that. And then I actually had a little bit of money. And so I had enough for a down payment on a property. One of the reasons why I left my boutique agency that I had and took the job at Showtime was also I was I was being essentially kind of kicked out. I was told I had to leave the place and I wasn't going to be able to get a mortgage. Like I did okay in my business, but I wasn't like killing it, especially the past year because the dot-com bubble had burst. Things weren't looking great financially. I was kind of teetering anyhow. So for me to then be like, oh, I have a job at like a company and I get a steady paycheck. That's how I was able to get a mortgage. You know, if you're an actor, I think you're going to have a hard time getting a mortgage so you could invest passively in real estate. Then you don't have to worry about the mortgage, but you need to have that the money. You know, a lot of these deals, it's like a $50,000 minimum. Now, there are opportunities that come up once in a while where it's a $25,000 minimum, but it's not beyond that. If, if you only have like $1,000 or $2,000 to invest in real estate, you could invest in one of these crowdfunding sites like Fundrise or whatever these ones are. I don't really do that. I'm not recommending that you do that because I don't really know how they vet the people and all that other kind of stuff. I don't play in that space. That's a way you could start to dabble in real estate, but you're going to need, you know, you're going to just go, go to every audition you possibly can, get yourself a show, and then try to save as much as possible. And, and then don't invest money in real estate that you might need in the next year or two because real estate is very illiquid. So your money goes into the real estate and it may sit there for five years or 10 years. I think it will do well. Like in like overall, the vast majority of the time, like the real, real estate does well over time, but it's not like money in the bank. You can't just, you can't take your money right back out of these things. You get distributions if the deal's performing well, but you can't be like a year later and say, oh, I want my 50K back because it's just not possible because we have to sell the property. Like we can't just come up with 50K to give you. If someone, the same person, young person, if someone wants to learn about real estate investing, where can they learn more? Buy my book. <laughs> and I know it's not out yet. I, it's going to be about six. But really, because if you're that person, this book is written for you. Because 
it's about me and my journey and starting off with being an actor. So someone in the arts and how I got to where I am now. And along the way, you will learn about real estate. I have these keystone concepts that I've put throughout that will teach you different concepts and different things to understand. Like the why being debt-free is not as good as being financially free or like the five different ways that real estate pays you or like what is depreciation like all these other things it teaches you in a, in a really easy and palatable way and so the book is like written for you so like get get my book um you know sign up for my email list you'll know when it's coming out i'm going to be giving out some free copies of it too there's books and there's podcasts out there but this book is written specifically if you're an artist <laughs> i can't think of a better parallel than my book honestly i know that may seem a little like self-promotional, but it's just kind of right on point. No, no, it's not. That's why we're talking to you. <laughs> you said financially free as opposed to debt free. I think I love that because I always sort of flippantly say, you know, oh, well, you have to pay off your debts first and then invest. Like that's the goal. You bring up a good point, which is it's about being financially free, not necessarily paying off all the debts. Right. The bad debts you pay off, the good debts like mortgages you keep. So you can have a million dollar home that you paid off and then you have no money and like, so you're debt free, but like you're kind of destitute or you have a responsibly mortgaged property. Let's say it's that same million dollars, just example. So you have 25, 250 in the property, then you have another $750,000 in cash that you have that you can live off of or whatever. So that's a bad and super high level example, but I think it illustrates sort of the point of, you don't have to be debt free to be financially free. I love talking about all this, but we're running out of time. So I'm going to skip all the Broadway questions. So final questions. What separates those that have a full time career in the arts versus those that do it for a while and then transition to something else or for people who never even tried to do it in the first place? Well, you'd have to ask someone who's full time in the arts what the difference is, because I don't know. <laughs> uh, persistence is really the key to anything in life. I treated my performing career as a business and was very persistent and was able to be successful in it. I found another passion that was really important to me. I never was like, oh, I'm not going to be an actor anymore. I was waiting for the right Broadway show to open and I ended up finding another passion and fell in love with and was actually making really nice money to say, oh my gosh, you know what? I'm really happy with my life and I'm not performing anymore and I don't miss it. And that you got to do what you love. If all you love is the theater, do the theater thing. Okay. I love that. Where can people find out more about you? So you can check out my website. It's MJPINV for MJP Investments, uh, MJPINV.com. You can sign up for my newsletter there. You can send me an email through the website. Uh, so it's mjpinv.com. Amazing. Simple. Um, Matt, I cannot thank you enough for chatting with us today. Thank you. Oh, Ethan, it's been a pleasure. That was our interview with Matt Pacheni. Thank you, Matt, for taking the time and for teaching me new things. My takeaways were QRP, Qualified Retirement Plan. I looked it up and I'm still not quite sure what it is. What I do know is that it's a retirement plan where investment income accumulates tax deferred. An IRA or a pension is a QRP, but what Matt referenced was more customized to him. All I can say for sure is what Bankrate.com says. It is a tax deferred retirement plan that meets the specifications laid out in Section 401A of the U.S. Tax Code. Now, it would take a specialized accountant to tell us what that actually means, but we learned there is another retirement vehicle out there. You don't always have to be an accredited investor to invest in real estate or Broadway. However, you still need to be a sophisticated investor and certainly never invest money you need to use to live. And finally, real estate is a measure of real value. It isn't a zero or a one in a computer. The real estate market can go up and down, but not at the speed of the stock market. And even if it goes down, you still have an actual building or piece of property. If you want to hear the rest of our interview, it's over on Patreon. You can help produce this show for as little as $3 a month. It's not quite the same as producing Moulin Rouge or Hamilton, but it makes a bigger difference for me and the show. Do that at patreon.com slash artistic finance. Heads up to future patrons. I give shout outs on the podcast to people who come in at the $10 level. I'm moving that to the $25 level in March. If you want a shout out without going to that level, 
be sure to become a patron by the end of February. If becoming a patron isn't for you, but you find value in the show and want to give back, please do me a favor and tell someone about the show. Word of mouth has been how most people have found the show, so if you could, recommend it to your friend or the artist in your life. If you know of an artist that you'd love to hear on the show, or someone that could contribute to our collective financial knowledge, please reach out and let us know. Matt was on the podcast today because someone took the time to reach out and suggest him as a guest. That's it for today. Until next time, break a leg. Thank you for listening to Artistic Finance. Find more information on our website, artisticfinance.com. Please subscribe to our podcast and please leave a rating and review. Artistic Finance is produced in New York City by Nicole and Ethan Steinle. Producing consultant Anne Nygren-Doherty. Graphics and website by Josh Cutler. Music by Chong Liu. 